All right, continuing our discussion of Turing machines, recall that last time I challenged you to think about how you could do 0 to the a 1, 0 to the b 1, 0 to the a plus b. Now, you could think of a tricky way to do this, but here's a really uh, dumb way to do it. What you do is you look through until you find the first 1. And then what you do is you replace it with a 0 after replacing the first 0 here with a blank. So the idea here is that you're going to take 0, a, 0 to the a1, 0 to the b1, and you're going to turn that into blank, 0 to the a minus 1, 1, 0 to the b, 1, 0 to the a plus b. And then you're going to turn that 1 into a 0. So you're going to turn that into 0 to the a, 0 to the b, 1, 0 to the a plus b, which is equal to 0 to the a plus b, 1, 0 to the a plus b. And then you're just going to check to make sure that this matches w hash w. Except that it's a variant of w hash w where w comes from 0 star and the hash is just equal to 1. So you do the exact same thing. You see that that's a 0. If it is, you go find the hash and you go turn the thing on the other side to a happy face and so on. So it's a really sneaky way to do it. So, all right. So with those examples out of the way, let's go back and be really precise about exactly what a Turing machine is. So a Turing machine T is a five tuple of Q, that's a weird looking Q, Q, sigma, gamma, delta, Q0, QA, and QR. Q is a finite set of states. Set of states. Sigma is an alphabet. Gamma is an alphabet. And there's a constraint, which is that sigma has to be a subset of gamma and blank has to be in gamma, but blank may not be inside of sigma. Q0, QA, and QR are all inside of Q, and they are respectively the start, accept, and reject states. Finally, delta has the following type. It goes Q, that's the state, cross, gamma, that's the tape, arrow, Q, that's the new state, gamma, cross, left, and right. Now technically, this Q right here is actually Q minus QA, QR, because once you go into QA and QR, you can't go back. All right. So, a configuration of a Turing machine is a gamma star paired up with a Q paired up with a gamma star. These are the things to the left, these are the things to the right. So we'll call that configuration C. 19.3 W is inside of the language of some Turing machine T if and only if, if we start from the configuration blank, actually epsilon, sorry, epsilon, yeah, let me erase that so it's more clear. If we start from the configuration epsilon Q0 W, and then we run for a while, and we end up with x, q, a, y, where x and y are inside of gamma star. Now here are the rules for how to evolve the state. So the first one is really easy. The first one says that x, q, i, y can go to blank x, Q, I, Y, blank. 
So at any time you want, you can just add a blank at the left and the right. And there's no condition for that. The next one is more interesting. The next one says, what happens if you're in, if you look at delta and QI A returns Q, J, B, and right. What does that mean? That means that we were in a state where we were in a configuration where X was behind us, we're in state Q, I, we're looking at an A, and after that is Y. And if that's the case, then we can go to an X where we replace the A with a B and we move to the right. So now we're in state Q, J, and then Y is in front of us. Now what if, when we look at this, we get delta q i a, and it's going to equal q j b and a left. What does that mean? That means that behind us is an x and a c. We're in state q i. In front of us is a and y. And then we're going to move to the left, meaning that x is going to be behind us. We're in QJ, a C is in front of us, then a B, and then the Y. Because the C that used to be on our left is now on our right. All right. Now, just some advice about implementing um, Turing machine tapes in your programs. My advice is to make it so that a tape is really just a, Q, uh, a, a, tr a tuple, sorry, a triple, where there's a uh, the string to the left and the string to the right. However, the string to the left stored in the opposite order, like backwards. The idea here is, is that you will have some function that's called like step. And step is going to take a configuration and return a configuration. Okay? And step is going to look like this. Step is going to say, when you call step, and you give it a the tape to the left. We'll call that T left. So let's do it like this. So we'll have the tape to the left, the state we're in QI, and the tape to the right. Okay, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the tape to the left prime, QJ, and the tape to the right prime. Where we'll say that A comma Y is equal to look at the tape to the right. And then what we'll do is we'll do We'll say that, we'll say, um, we'll do a case. So here, here's what we'll do. Say it like this. Then we'll say that QJ B direction equals calling delta, equals calling delta on QI and A. All right, so now we need to look at what D is. So if we look at what D is, what's gonna, what we're going to return is we're going to return a new TL prime and TR prime. And it's going to equal a case on D of the following. Okay, so if D is right, then in that case, TL prime is going to be, we're going to take B and we're going to put it at the front of what was already behind us, the left. Okay? Because that B has just been moved over and what is to our right is now just going to be Y. And left, what we're going to do there if it's a left, well, if it's a left, it's a little bit more complicated because what we need to do is we need to say, we need to look at what's behind us. So we're going to say x is going to be behind us and then c appended to so prepended to be prepended to y where b 
comma x, sorry, c comma x is equal to look of tl. All right now, what is this look function? What look does is it takes a list of characters and returns a character and a list of characters. And if you call look and you give it the empty list, then what it does is it's going to return a blank and then the empty list. But if you call look and you give it something that has at least one thing in it, which we'll call a x, then in that case, we'll return that a and then we'll return the x. So essentially what look does is it's going to it's going to sneak in a blank whenever necessary. And so notice that the list to the left, because we just append right here, we're storing it pointing backwards. So for instance, if we had the configuration 0, 1, 1, Q, X, 1, 0, 1, and that would be stored as a triple that has a Q, X right here. And then this is a pointer to a 1, that's a pointer to a 0, that's a pointer to a 1, that's a pointer to the empty list. And then this is a pointer to a 1, to a 1, to a 0, and then to the empty list. Then we can easily move to the left by just taking this 1 and putting it on the other side and moving this pointer down there. And we can move to the left by taking this 1 moving it to the other side. So we just make this point to there and it point to that thing, and then this just points to the thing that was before it. So it's a very quick O1 movement if we store the thing on the left in the opposite order. All right. Now let's talk, let's start analyzing Turing machines and talking about a few different pieces, a few different aspects of them. So the first thing is that notice that Turing machines they return a yes or a no, just like all the other machines that we've seen. But because Turing machines have the, um, the ability to write down stuff in the, um, uh, on the tape, we can make a variant of Turing machines that return an answer. So we say that a computable function, function f, is a Turing machine. Okay, and we write f of x equals y if and only if when we start with epsilon, q0, and x, and we run for a while, we get back some string w, qa, and then y in front of us. So for instance, we could write a function like add 1 that would add one on binary numbers by saying add one of zero would return one, add one of one would return one zero, add one of one zero would return one one, and so on. The idea here is that this is our input. It's gonna run, it's eventually gonna accept, and then whatever characters are after where the um, Turing machine is looking, that's what the answer is. So we're gonna call that a computable function. Okay. Imagine how you would write a function like this, where f of x given 0, sorry, f of 0 to the x plus 0 to the y, we want it to turn into 0 to the x plus y. How could you write something that did that? Well, here's a, a sneaky way to do it. What we do is we take the first 0, we replace it with the blank, we go find that plus, replace it with a 0, and then we rewind back and put the head in front of the blank. That would be a way to do that. My advice is that when you're thinking about designing Turing machines, never, never think about how to do it in a way that the Turing machine understands what's happening. Do it in a way that makes it so that the text looks the way it's supposed to. And that is the way that you will, that it will work. All right. So the next thing that I'd like to talk about with Turing machines Let's actually go back to DFAs. So 
when we run a DFA on input W, how long could it take to accept or reject? Well, because DFAs are going to look at every single character, and they have to look at every single character, and then after they're done looking at every single one, then they say yes or no, that means that it will always take exactly the length of W steps. And it will always say yes or no. So after that many steps, we get a yes or a no. Now, what about a PDA? A PDA. How long could it take? Well, recall that we can write PDAs that just sit there and do nothing because they can just constantly push things onto the stack and never actually look at the input. So what that means is that PDAs, if they're left to their own devices, they can run forever and just stop. But recall that we know that um, the PDA has to be simulating at some level the derivation of the context for grammar. And because of that, what we can do is we know that the depth of the tree can't be more than the than exponential in the length of the string. So that means that if we wait two to the length of w steps, then we are guaranteed to get a yes or a no, or the program's running forever. And if it's running forever, then we know that that means no, and it's not gonna say yes. So basically, after a certain number of steps, we'll always get a yes, or something that we can use to learn a no. We either get a yes, or we get a no, or we can figure out that it's supposed to be no. Because if it's not a yes by this time, it is no. All right, so let's think about that same question for a Turing machine. How long does a Turing machine take? Well, there can't be a predictable answer. The reason why there can't be a predictable answer is because Turing machines do not have to go to the accept or the reject state. Let's think about what happens if they do. If they accept, then that means that they start in epsilon q0w, and then they run for a while. They run for a while, and they eventually get to qa and y. And who knows how long this is? It could take any amount of time, because we could go back and forth over the strings over and over and over again. Same with a reject. If the string gets rejected, then that means that we ran, we ran, and then we got to some string, and we got to QR. Okay, But that could take a long time. What are some other possibilities about what could happen with a Turing machine? Well, what could happen with a Turing machine is that it could loop. And what that means is, is that where we start in Q0W and then we run for a while, and then we get to some state um, that let's write down as um, u q i v and then we could run some more and get back to that same configuration u q i v what that means is that we actually get to a configuration not a state a configuration where we've actually been in exactly this configuration before Think about what that means. That means that like the memory on your computer, like all the zeros and ones, they're in some configuration. And then you run for a while and you get back at that same one. Well, the reason that you changed is based on what was happening in the past. So because you followed that path back to the same place, it's just going to keep happening over and over and over again. Well, the last thing that could happen is what we call diverging. And what that means is, is that it's actually we, we have to state it as a theorem 
we have to say for all x, q, i, y, epsilon, q, zero, w, goes to x, q, i, y, implies that x, q, i, y, goes to x prime, q, j, y prime, i.e. there exists an x prime, q, j, y prime, such that um, q, j is not inside of q, a, or q, r. Now technically diverging is a special case of looping, but it says that there's just always a next state. And actually, we tend to use these two terms interchangeably. We'll say diverging when we mean looping. We'll say looping when we mean diverging. Basically, the point is, is that a Turing machine can either accept, reject, or run for an arbitrarily long amount of time and never return an answer. However, notice that if it doesn't return an answer, that means it does not reach accept, which means it does not accept it. So if something diverges, then that means it's not in the language. So what we do is we say that Turing machines can be divided into two categories. So a Turing machine is either a recognizer, and a recognizer may loop on some input. Or it is a decider, and it never loops, i.e. it always gives an answer. And we say that a language is Turing recognizable, which we abbreviate as sigma1 if there exists a machine that is a recognizer where the language of that machine is the language. So a language A is Turing recognizable if the language equals that. And instead we say that it is Turing decidable, which we abbreviate as sigma zero if the language of that machine is equal to B. All right, so A and B. Now, what we're going to do next, we are going to prove, and when I say next, I don't mean like literally the next thing, I mean over the course of the next coming time, what we're gonna do is we are gonna prove the following. We're gonna say that we have our whole set of languages, all that is the power set of sigma star. Down at the bottom, we have fin, which has stuff like 0, 1. Then we have reg, which has 0 star, 1 star. Then we have CFL, and CFL is going to have, sorry, it does have 0 to the n, 1 to the n. Then we have sigma 0. Those are the ones that are decidable. Decidable i.e. no loops. And this is where we have things like 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. Then we're going to have sigma 1, and it's going to have complicated, so these ones may loop. And this is going to have complicated problems, which I'll tell you the abbreviation of, but we're not going to explain it yet. It's going to have problems like ATM. And then what we're going to show is that that is distinct from this category, that has things like not ATM. And this is what the rest of the class is going to be about, building up this framework. But we do have to do a little bit more of understanding how Turing machines work and what some of their capabilities are before we can do that. So uh, that's good for today, and we'll talk next time.